So SMSs are a pretty rich source of personalized data in India, and um, they sort of applicable to a lot of use cases, especially in fintech, personal finance. Um, and if, so if you're a data scientist or engineer interested in this kind of data, uh, then hopefully this talk is interesting. But also I think if you're a, a data scientist or engineer who's interested in complex problems where you're layering models on top of each other, uh, then in a more generalized way, it might not be with SMSs, then hopefully this is also interesting to you. Um, and I also kind of want to have two broad theme takeaways that uh, hopefully come out through the course of the talk. And the first one is uh, an illustration of a, the simple but important concept of breaking something into pieces and solving the pieces. And I, and I like the way that uh, the mathematician math, uh, Max Tegmark puts it, where he says, you know, if you have a tough question that you can't answer, first solve, uh, a, first tackle a, a, a simpler question that you can't answer. Um, and it is a creepy way of, of expressing this concept. And the second takeaway uh, has to do with the architecture and design of these systems. Uh, when you're applying machine learning to a problem, uh, at least in my experience, you almost never fully understand what you're building uh, when you start, which means you'll need to do things uh, 25 and 50% and 75% into the project that you didn't realize you'd have to do at the beginning. Um, unfortunately, you also face things like path dependency and early choices affect late choices. So. I think a key concept to think about when you're thinking about how do I design the system in the early stages is, is the quality of extensibility. Uh, and in my experience, a lot of engineers and startups make the mistake of uh, making a big issue of scalability and uh, while forgetting about extensibility. And I think this is a shame because you're far more likely to, we're far more likely to face the problem. We can only hope to, to face the scalability issue, you know, massive numbers, uh, but we're almost surely going to face the problem of, uh, we're going to face the challenges of uh, breaking down because of extensibility. How do we extend our system to do things that we didn't know we would have to do? <laughs> so a bit about uh, actually the doesn't seem to be connected. Ah, there we go. Sorry. Appreciate it. Uh, so a little bit about me, and I think also just to give you some context for how I think about this talk. Um, my career is kind of my professional experience is uh, kind of oscillated between two key themes, one of which is being statistical inference. Uh, th thinking about how do you actually ask questions about causality uh, from data and in order to inform decision making. And then the other side is is the engineering and the software because you can develop really complex and interesting models that help you, you know, apply causal inference. But until it can go into production, until you can deal with all the dirty problems of getting data from one place to the other, or making a decision and then recording what happens, uh, and did it really was it really the right one? Um, it it it, be, it stays pretty academic, and so I've kind of gone from uh, you know spend time in. I graduate work in university and in government where I was thinking more about the statistical inference. And then as I've moved into the private sector, um, it's become more about how you engineer the system so that it act actually works. Uh, and, and, um, and most recently, I, I co-founded a startup called Paysense, which is a mobile lending startup here in India based in Mumbai. Uh, and then and this is kind of where this problem set came out for me and sort of represents some of the work we did there and some of the work I've continued to do afterwards. And now I'm actually at a venture capital firm where I'm a data scientist in residence and um, called Montane Ventures. And I do want to just give a quick plug because I think one of the things I like to think about is, is, is when you're investing in things to the notion of really understanding the product and technology that's being built that a lot of times ent entrepreneurs care about is something that you miss out on if, you, if you're not from that space as well. And so we're really into uh, thinking about the problems that the engineers think about, that entrepreneurs think about, that aren't necessarily related to like necessarily just is it a good business, but are you actually building a technology that's interesting and that's it's going to be applicable widely. So if you're, in the, if you're interested in that kind of thing, by all means, come talk to me. Okay, so 
this is what we're here to talk about today. Um, and if you have a phone in India, you know what these look like. You have them on your phone. And uh, interest, interestingly, what differentiates SMSs, which is a worldwide uh, technology, in India, a little bit differently than in Singapore and U.S., other places I've lived and worked, is that in India, because of the requirement of two-factor authentication, authentication um, banks and other financial transactions that happen online, you have to you involve uh, uh, approval through the phone. So we have like things like OTP. And a side product of that is that uh, because the phone is such an important part of everyday life anyway, um, that a lot of the services that we interact with as consumers, as people, uh, all have some element of, of the phone in them. So you'll get your notifications from Uber and from, and from Amazon as well as from your bank. And, and so it becomes, a very, as I was saying at the beginning, a very rich source of data. And the, the technical problem here, ultimately, when you're thinking about the use case of, say, giving a loan, um, what you care about is how much did this person spend and what's their typical balance, bank balance look like. Um, but what we have as a raw form of data is an SMS that looks like this. And the machine doesn't know that the... Um, that you spent 4000 on the credit card. It just sees this sort of raw text. And so the technical problem we're going to talk about today, that sort of statistical problem, machine learning problem, is moving from this to this in an automated way, where we can sort of say every, every message is composed of, um, of a template structure and then variable information. Um, and so it's, it's not your typical NLP. It's not what I think a lot of times people talk about when they're talking about NLP, right? It's, this is, the problem is, in a lot of ways, not as hard as something like Twitter, where you have just no structure. Uh, anyone can say whatever they want. This is, there's latent structure here. Um, it's just the variable amounts that are changing. You're all receiving the same message. But it's not so simple as that in the sense that there's... Um, there's a lot of variation in the templates and other things. This is the general problem we're, we're looking at. Um, and, and, and why does it ma matter? Um, maybe you do care about the use cases uh, and not just the technical issues here. This is a fintech market map in India. And I would say I've looked at most of these companies. And most of them are at least asking permission, uh, which you may not read when you click OK and install the app, uh, for them to access your SMSs. And, trying to use it in different ways. Um, and so, so I don't think this is like, this is not like a cutting edge problem, but I don't think necessarily that the solutions to it have been done as well as, so I've, I often hear people say, for instance, that this is a commodified problem. I, I think that's similar to sort of saying if you're in 2000, you said search was commodified, right? There's definitely been search systems around, but the, the, the extent of their development and evolution is not, is not quite there yet. Um, so, and, and you might see that, like, so in a personal finance, we have companies like Walnut, right? And they'll often not get things right where you have, maybe you have two bank accounts and you make a transaction and you receive a notice that you, it is a debit or a withdrawal on one of your accounts and a credit on the other. And knowing that that's actually moving within your system and is not like a net outflow and then inflow um, is something a, a lot of times they get wrong. Um, Okay, so before we jump into the system, I also want to kind of point out that this is not, and I've, I've talked about this problem before, and a lot of times people will come up and ask, um, you know, how do, can we access some of this data? Because, you know, it's interesting. And um, what I do want to say is that while you, you won't necessarily, as, a, as an independent person, you won't necessarily be dealing with some of the problems at scale, um, this, this is not a problem that you can't touch on grab a hold of and, and try your hand at um, just because you don't have an app out there that's collecting p other people's data. So by all means, and I'll just sort of walk through a couple of ways you can get started. So say uh, you have an iPhone, which is the kind of phone I have, uh, which you won't necessarily get in your app, but you can basically go to this fairly obscure site. If you do a, take an image backup of the phone, um, and you'll find this very obscure labeled file, which actually ends up being a, a SQLite database. And there, th that's where your messages are stored. And, uh, if you have an Android, it's a fairly similar process. I haven't actually tried this too many times because I don't have an Android phone, but I'm, it, it's worked once. Uh, and then 
that'll give you your messages and maybe the messages of some of your family or friends who are willing to like help seed your data set. There are other ways to kind of try to uh, sort of initiate even more var variety in your sample. So there's a lot of SM bulk SMS service providers out there who provide templates, provide other message structures for you to, so for basically for apps who are wanting to send bulk SMSs. You can Google those, you can pull them down, and then all of a sudden you've got a whole new set of templates. And then don't stop there because that won't give you enough variety. I think uh, the next step is simulation. And actually this is a sort of a side note that I think uh, it, this is actually useful even if you don't need it, you have the data, because creating this kind of data actually forces you to really understand what the data generation process was. Where did, how does it actually come from? And it, it'll, it'll help you think through this. So what we're doing here is just a basic Python script uh, using regex uh, and some strings. So we have a template across the top, a message that happens to be a credit message. And then we can think, look, the way this is phrased in English is, is pretty arbitrary. You could compose it any way, and in fact, we do compose it different ways. So let's just create some artificial variation that's uh, sort, of sort of syntactically different, but not meaningfully different. Um, and then we'll just create a script that will cycle through messages like this and, and, and randomize and vary it. And so then from one template, you've got many different templates. So instead of saying has been deposited to, you can say credited to or deposited into or deposited in or credited in. As humans, we don't care about that variation, but that's the variation we're going to try and ignore and try and decipher when, when our machines are learning. Um, so, and we do need the variation because the variation ends up being the problem. If we only had like five templates for a bank or even 35 templates for a bank that had all the different types of message, then you could just like manually look in them uh, and, and write some regex and, and brute force it. Um, but that's not the case that we're in. So in India, just doing some basic e easy research, you'll sort of see we have hundreds of banks of different types as well as all the kind of service providers that are also recording and SMSing things as to your transactions and other things that, that might be applicable to the use case you have as a business or, a, or as an application. <laughs> and so because they're all creating their own templates, creating their own message structures and entity types, uh, this is where the variation comes and this is why the sort of brute force raw just manually labeling these messages is, is not necessarily going to work very well. Okay, so now we've kind of set up that context um, and we can think about how do we design, uh, how do we get to the information we ultimately care about? So from here on out, let's sort of set aside a lot of the type of SMSs and focus on banks because those are really interesting. Those are financial data. Um, and, and actually, I should actually just pause for a second and say, before we get into this sort of statistical stuff, the, the other concern that you, you know, is definitely there that also this helps you make aware of is that there's a lot of personal identifiable information in here. I mean, this is, uh, in, uh, in SMSs, this can be all kinds of private sensitive information from, from whatever your financial transactions are, if you're very sensitive about that, to, to, to Shahidi and other sites that are very personal. Um, and uh, one, of the, one of the things you also want to do when you're designing these systems, and we had a, a panel yesterday where we talked about ethics and accountability and things like that. For me, it's very important. You should be thinking also about when you design the system, how do you design it such that you minimize the information that you don't want to capture? Uh, just a starting way, sort of the baseline, is that there's uh, every, uh, every sender that sends bulk SMSs is required to register with the government, and they get a six-character ID address, um, which is different than a phone number when you're SMSing uh, personally uh, amongst friends and family. And so when you're setting up your SDK to capture this, this data, uh, you would sort of ex exclude the personal information, at least the personal SMSs, and only go for messages coming in through the sender, uh, sort of a six-character ID, which is a transactional SMS. Okay, so we, we have those SMSs, and we say, we're, let's say we're taking the lending case. We're interested in, we're really interested in these, these particular pieces of information. We debited 300 
rupees, or we debited, uh, and, and our balance is forty nine forty six. Um, and so th this is like this is our end goal, but this is not. Uh, but uh, there's, there's also like this is just the highest level. So a debited is a basic transaction. A credit is a tra basic transaction. As you go in, you start to realize that there's a lot of also specifics in your ontology where you have to really be thinking about your domain. So uh, if, you're, if you're lending money, you care about, for instance, is a person making their payments on time? So there might be a due notice, and you want to, but you don't want to classify a due notice as a, as a debit, right? It hasn't happened yet. Uh, you have your late fees. You have your, uh, your bounce checks, your double bounce checks. There's a, they all mean something differently, and you, you can't just capture a list of amounts, right? You need all of the structure uh, and the context for that amount for it to be meaningful. And that's what we, what we want. And so we say, how do we go from like this raw text down to this level? Like where, what, what's our handle? Do we just build a model that says like, like, let's say classify this message as having a debit and the 300 is the debit or... So this is where the design, you start to think through what do you actually want to get out of it? What kind of layers are going to be there? Uh, and and, and uh, how do you even structure a model? So the a first step is, um, let's say we're interested in banks, right? But we have a whole set of SMSs, and I kind of just easily said we're interested in banks, but the machine doesn't know which messages are for banks. And so as a start, we'll just sort of, let's say, we're going to classify messages that are coming from banks. And so you might... You know, so that, that's, you think that's going to be pretty straightforward, right? Because there's that latent structure in bank messages and there's a very commonality of topics. So bank messages will tend to have uh, sort of financial terminology in them. They'll have things like account strings. They'll usually have a date string because it was a transaction. So it has a timestamp, date stamp associated with it. So the, those things will help us uh, uh, identify a bank and you'll like classify a message whether it's from a bank. But uh, if we do that, we're actually leaving a lot of information on the table, right? We're, we're solving a problem where we don't necessarily need to, like, look at a message and decide whether it's from a bank. Um, why? Because the sender is the bank, and the sender sends a lot of other messages. So if we jump right in and start classifying at the level of the message, we're leaving all of the other messages that that sender is sending on the table. So instead, what we can do is just say, let's aggregate... Um, all of our messages that come from a particular sender, and then classify the sender. So we know now that HDFCBK means bank. And then we, we say, okay, now we have our bank messages. Um, before we can really get to the 300 rupees, we need to know the context of it. So for instance, you know, just at a very high level, we have debit messages and credit messages and due and overdue. And then we're, again, we're going to say, uh, we have a, a more limited set of, uh, uh, of variability of text because we know it's bank messages and it tends to be one of these types. So we're hoping that there's structure in there that we can e e sort of identify and classify to know that this message is debit and this is a credit. And that's really important because if you get it wrong, uh, you have money coming in when it should be going out or vice versa. And that's uh, going to mess up your, your, your risk models. Okay, and then... Um, and then say we're interested in knowing a person's and tracking a person's bank balance over time. Um, well, we, we could model like where the bank balance is in, in, a, in a message, um, but it doesn't always show up. So here's Citibank, and here's two type of messages from Citibank that are both debited messages. Um, one contains a balance information and one doesn't. Right? So we wouldn't want to find ourselves hopefully in a position where we're looking for the bank balance in a message that doesn't have the bank balance. It might end up getting confused and classifying the account number as the balance or, uh, or the debit amount. So we also need to classify the entity type that we're looking for. So let's think about how we would do that because now we're not just classifying the full message, which was it's like... For a bank, it was just like a full set of messages. For a debit message, you're just classifying. You don't need to know anything about the positionality or anything in the message. You just need to know this is a debit message. This has a balance. Now we've got that. We know, it. We know this has the balance amount in it. But how do we know where it is? So one way to do that is to like say, well, we know that like a balance amount will be a, um, a currency amount. 
So we can say, let's make some rules where we just isolate numbers that uh, only contain, say, a period not, uh, uh, not associated with any so alpha of the alphanumeric or dashes or anything like that. And so now we've identified, and we can do that just with, like, with, the, with a parsing structure. And then, then we can say, okay, once we've done that, we still need to know which one of these numbers represents which one of the entities. So one way to do that is sort of take a sub-segment approach where you take each of those messages and you say you have some n, uh, say 3 or 4, and you do n plus 3, n minus 3, so you get a sub-segment on the message. And now you have that number, and you can classify the sub-segment. So now, because if you look at these two sub-segments, you can kind of see, well, we'll be able to learn that this, uh, the 12,040 is the debit and the... Um, one lakh thirty thousand is the balance. So each one of these is a model, and we're kind of layering them on, and we're not trying to solve this final objective until we've solved the earlier and solved the earlier, uh, easier problem. And we have our pipeline, and it kind of goes through. So we're receiving SMSs, and then we're sending them into. A, uh, each classifier, and we're figuring out when to store and when to send and, and when to classify, and ultimately our financial structured data goes into our database. And the system uh, looks might look like this at one step. So I'll, I'll read it because I think unfortunately the the resolution's not great enough for you to be able to read. So we we have a new message submitted to the, the platform, and it kind of goes through the system. In fact, I have some more granular versions of this, so I'll wait for that. But w what I kind of want to point out is that, um, is that in this system, even, even though you've broken it down, for me, it's, like all, it, it's also important to understand the human-machine trade-off. So humans will always be able to do highly sensitive sort of analysis. We, we can kind of recognize variance difference very easily. Machine, machines don't do it as well. So, like have a machine solve a problem, but try not to res rely on it completely. Figure out how you can kind of combine the two. So, so we see, receive a message, let's say we're, we're just classifying at the bank level. We compare the list, the sender to a list of known senders, and we determine their identity. And if it's unknown, we send it to the model, and if it's known, we assign a category, right? Great. Now, say, let's say we receive messages without a, with an unknown sender. So then we might, so we'll go through some transformations on the data itself. We'll anonymize strings containing numeric values. I'll talk a little bit more about that. We'll hash some n-grams, talk a little more about that in a bit. And we'll predict probability of sender category. We'll determine if it's, the probability is clear and uh, if, if the category probability is ambiguous or not. If it's not, then we're going to go ahead and assign it. If it is, we're going to send it to the user. And what I mean by user in this case is, especially if you're building the system like as a lender, you really need to understand the data that you're doing underwriting on top of. So it, it matters in this case that you're getting it right. So what we did was built out a visual interface. And for that, you know, for the 5 or 10% where we're unclear, for instance, um, it's very easy to tell the difference between a bank message and, like, tends to be like a, an a, 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 a Uber-type message or an Ola. But uh, there's a lot of NBFCs out there that look very similar. And so you'll get, end up getting... You know, so where we get our false positives is with, with that. And so uh, we built just a basic system, uh, a high-level interface that would allow our, uh, our customer service team and other teams to sort of sit there. And as messages came through when we weren't getting the classification right or, or we were not very confident about our classification, that that would go through to them and they would be able to sort of say, oh, we missed, um, we missed this one, it's wrong, and, and, and then they would relabel it and that would be transformed through regex and it would go in and correct the model. And uh, that was actually also very important for us. And that's where a lot of the change over time happened where we, we realized we had to model things that we didn't think we had to model before where our risk team was like, wait, this is a late notice, but it's a third late notice. You can't classify it. You need to be able... And it's not the same late notice. It's a late notice plus the, 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 the amount is increased. So you need to actually be classifying that separately not, and not the same way. You can't just sort of say you received three late notices. Um, and that matters because some banks will, like, 
send you lay notices over and over and over again. They're just excited to get their money back. And some banks will just do it all, you know, occasionally. And so you, that's, that's a sort of, that shouldn't be related to the person's propensity to repay. And so you don't want to have that noise in your, uh, confusing your signal. So then there's a lot of like the details, right, of the system as you're, as you're building it out. So um, well, a lot of times with the classification, you know, at the earlier stages, what we're doing is we're classifying the template. We're not classifying the entity, right? And so when you're doing that, you're really looking for, in that early version, remember you have the template and you have the variable. And you're really looking to classify, you're looking to kind of exclude the variable. If you have the variable in your data, what we're doing is basically vectorizing text. Um, you're going to have a much wider data data set, right? A, lo a long tail, where it's like a lot of messages with just you know um, a debit amount that that can be any number, right? And so that, but it doesn't really mean if the difference between 300 and 100 rupees is meaningless for your model. So like you don't want that there. And there's different ways you can do that depending on like your throughput and your and how much where you want to do your computation. One way is, for instance, is like say the messages are being passed into a into a, like a Postgre database, some relational database. You might want to, when you're actually pulling in the data, say you've received enough messages from a new sender to be able to classify or run it through the model. You might want to clean it as you're querying it, and, and that works. And that works okay. Where if you're just sort of taking out numbers. Um, then you might get more complex, and you might say, no, we're going to do, we want to be a little more variable in how we clean, how we transform the text before we send it to the model. So we might do it in a script. So for instance, uh, we might want to clean dates, um, and then we'll, we'll write some regex, and we'll, we'll think about some logic to be able to identify the dates. Because dates, like amounts, it, it shouldn't matter, right? It doesn't matter that it's March or April. That doesn't make a difference for identifying a debit message. Um, and then we'll have other problems like, like size. So if you're lending and you're, people are receiving 20, 30, 40, 100 messages a day or every couple of days and you've got tens of thousands of users, uh, you're, you're quickly getting a lot of, a lot of weight. So uh, there's different ways to handle that. I, when you're early stages, um, um, actually... Before I talk about the, the size, let me talk about pipelines. So because you have all the, it, once you start to do more complex tr text transformations, uh, you might, we were talking about pipelines in a more abstract sense of the course of this talk, but there's also more particular pipelines like uh, SKLearn has, Scikit-Learn has uh, a, a concept called pipelines. And what that does is allow you to package a lot of the transformations, a lot of the cleaning that you're doing and that you might be doing before you, you want to send the, the data through, the message through the model, um, but in a very clean and like in, in, in packaged way. And so basically it's just like, let's say you identify your vectorizer and you give it some specifications. Maybe you have some missing data imputation or something else which uses some other data set to like find a, a value for the missing or other types of transformations. And then you can basically pass all of that to a pipeline and then subsequently, you can just call that classifier and all of it's nicely packaged. And I think that ends up saving you a lot of effort when you've got different text transformation methods being applied to different stages of the model. Um, being able to like, make sure that they're all cleanly in one place, your, your engineers, your data scientists, when you're looking back, you may not have written that code uh, you, you certainly won't understand it, even if you wrote it a couple of months ago. Uh, so when it's clean like this, I, I think this is, a, is like really uh, a good way to do things. And actually, I want to give a talk plug because there was a talk at PyData Chicago last year uh, where uh, I talked about this. I think it's a, a pretty good concept, especially for when you're doing this thing of layering a lot of models on top of each other. Uh, so then we can talk about size as well. Um, Let's say we read, we, we have a couple of million messages, and it's a little more than we want to deal with as we're sort of testing our model. So you can read it in chunks, sort of put it into an iterator, and you can use what Scikit-Learn has a uh, hashing ve vectorizer. And what that does is allow you to uh, basically do all the, th the things, 
same things you would with a vectorizer. But, um, but then uh, sort of up, so basically you're doing a partial fit. So you'll cycle through your iterator, and um, you'll, do, you'll do your transformations, and you'll, do, you'll apply your class of, the, uh, classifier with a partial fit. So basically, it's just updating the model on the segment of the data um, and doesn't need the entire vocabulary. And you have to make a lot of choices when you're doing this kind of thing. So for instance, with uh, the, the hashing vector vectorizer, um, it's, it's great because it's uh, low memory scalable to large data sets, right? Like I said, it doesn't need to store the whole vocabulary dictionary in memory. Uh, it's fast, et cetera. But um, you can't necessarily, before I was doing a TF-IDF, I was doing a, um, a particular kind of vectorizing. And um, you can't do that with this because it doesn't store the memory. Uh, and often what that means is that um, if you're trying to understand what the model is doing, like which features mattered, uh, you won't be able to, to do that if you're using the hashing vectorizer. Fortunately, in this case, right, we don't care about that because it's not, we don't need to account for why a message was cl classified in a particular way. As long as it's accurate, as long as the model's accurate, we don't really need to know, like, what actually were the features that caused this to be a, a do notice and this to be a late notice. Um, and so... Uh, there's a lot of these micro choices, and then, um, and over time, you you get quite a, a large complex system. Uh, and if you've if you've sort of taken care at each piece level, when you're going back and changing it, it's fairly it, it's much easier to go in, make your change to the piece, update the way you do it, expand the amount of information you can capture without sort of taking down the entire system. And so here, you know, we just we receive a message, we do the classifying of the sender, we send it to the model, we do all the vectorizing, and we repeat for messages. So um, we're sending it to the user so that they can cl clarify ambiguous ones, and, and then we're doing that at each level of the model, and, and that's the kind of system we get. So uh, I wanted to end a little bit early. I think I'm successful so that we can have room for questions. Um, that's it.